Welcome to another episode of Search News You Can Use with me, Dr. Marie Haynes. It's Wednesday, December 16th of 2020. I can't believe 2020 is almost over. It feels like it's been the longest year of my life, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree. We're almost near the end of 2020, and even though I said there wasn't going to be a core update, there was one. You know that by now. Um, In this episode, I'm going to talk about my early thoughts on the December core update. We're still deep in analysis, but there's a few things that we've noticed about this update that I think would be interesting for most of you to hear. Um, In this episode, I'll give some very brief advice on what I think it's going to take to recover uh, should you have been hit by this update, Uh, but that will come more in the weeks to come. We've got a lot more analysis to do. We're also going to talk uh, about the future of the structured data testing tool. Uh, We've got some interesting information um, on a study that shows a correlation between authoritative of links in ranking, which I know doesn't seem like a big deal, but there's something in this. And so I'm going to share my thoughts about this as well. And we've got an interesting Q&A question about schema and uh, whether you can use schema when you get a quote from an expert. Uh, so I'm going to give my thoughts on that as well. So let's get right into it. Um, most of you who are listening to this podcast, you've probably come here for information on the most recent Google update, the December core update. So when I started to write my notes out for podcast uh, today, the update, as far as we knew, was still rolling out. Um, again, it's right now the afternoon uh, in Eastern time, at least, of uh, December 6th. 16th, and Danny Sullivan has just tweeted that the update has finished rolling out. So if you were affected by the December core update, um, then you would have seen the effects by now. The update, as we know, started on December 3rd, and most of the sites that we saw affected, you saw the effects immediately, like between December 3rd and December 4th is when you're going to start seeing either increases or decreases. There's been a lot of talk in the last week about something happening on December 10th of 2020. Um, And I think this is probably just a continuing rollout of the update. I know a lot of people were saying, oh, Google tweaked something. Maybe Google rolled something back. It's really rare for Google to roll something back. If they push out an algorithm update, they've done extensive testing on these updates. And it's, I, I can't remember the last time, I can't really remember Google thoroughly, like completely rolling back an update that they released. So whatever happened on December 10th was not a rollback. Now, a couple of people have posted uh, showing that they were maybe improving on December 3rd when the update first started rolling out. And then all of their gains were reversed on December 10th uh, as the update continued to roll out. Uh, And this is why a lot of people were maybe speculating that there was a reversal or some type of a rollback of the the update. The thing is, though, this is not the standard or the typical pattern. Uh, I know a lot of you listening to this might have seen um, changes on December 10th that uh, contradict or go in the opposite direction to whatever happened when this first rolled out. But when we look at our clients, A good number of our clients were affected one way or the other, and uh, very few of them, like I think pretty much every single one, the effect started on December 3rd. So I've written a little bit more about this in newsletter. If you're new to podcast, this podcast episode actually goes along with our written newsletter. Uh, This is episode number 163 of Search News You Can Use, which you can always find at mariehaines.com slash newsletter. And just to get the um, text technical stuff out of the way. Uh, We have two versions of newsletter. There's a free version, which is essentially just, look, if if you want to keep up to date with Google announcements and, uh, you know, the the stuff that everybody in the SEO world needs to know, uh, free versions available to everybody. Um, You know, we have quite a few subscribers, thousands and thousands of subscribers to this. We also have a paid version uh, where you can... um, Uh, basically get more insight into what we think is happening with Google algorithm updates and a lot more. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to discuss here is in the paid version. There's also extra information in there as well. We, We have a bunch of theories on what Google's doing, and I'm not quite ready to talk about these in podcasts just yet. Um, a lot of this just sort of materialized today, and so I want to sit on this for a few more days uh, before I, I make it official. I have put a lot of this, like I said, in uh, the premium subscriber section of newsletter. So if you want to hear my early thoughts on 
um, you know, which types of sites were affected and what we think the steps to recovery are going to be, then uh, again, episode number 163. Something to know is that this update really feels different than any other ones that we've analyzed. I've been analyzing Google updates since the very first Panda updates, which were in 2011. And, uh, you know, for the last uh, quite a few years, this has been pretty much my sole day-to-day work is analyzing what is it that Google's doing. Uh, We have a list of quite a few sites now that were affected by, uh, you know, this update or even we're still working on sites that were, uh, that have come to us after being affected by the May core update as well. Um, And so, uh, you know, we've analyzed a lot of different websites and a lot of different updates and this one feels different. Something that I'll tell you is that in the past, like when Panda and Penguin first came out, they were essentially site-wide. There were maybe some exceptions where Panda could affect a, a certain section of a site, like maybe a news blog or something like that. Um, but for the most part, if your website was affected by one of these Google algorithm updates, it had essentially the same effect across the board. You know, we'd see like maybe a site had a 40% uh, drop in um, traffic to one particular page and a 42% to another page and like a 39% drop to another page. They were all very, very closely tied. Um, and it was almost as if uh, Google's algorithms sort of, I, I know there's no like single EAT score or anything like that. It wouldn't surprise me if there is a quality score, but essentially um, in the past when websites were affected, it often was the entire site that would be affected. And then we saw with more recent core updates, uh, you know, the May core update, we really felt affected specific pages uh, as opposed to entire sites. And Google started to recognize, and and we theorized that Google was using BERT uh, for natural language processing to determine which pages truly were the best in terms of having the appropriate EAT to answer a question and also uh, the relevancy. So when somebody types in a search query, you know, Google's job is to provide us with uh, a page that is trustworthy but also meets our needs. And I know they're not perfect. They they don't have it 100%, but I feel like this update, they got a little closer. And I know a lot of you are sitting there saying, well, you know, my website dropped and the sites that are outranking me look ultra spammy. And in some cases, what we're seeing is that uh, we'll look at a site and go, oh my goodness, why did this site get elevated ab- amongst one of our clients? You know, why why is Google promoting this site that looks super spammy? And then when we start reading the article, we realize that, you know what, this article actually is very helpful. And I feel like in some cases, Google's been able to look past uh, design and things that as SEOs would make us go, oh, this is a spammy website and find the actual goal in the uh, the content. Um, so where to go from here? In newsletter, we have, uh, I've given several screenshots of the types of typical patterns that we're seeing. We have a large number of sites that were affected either positively or negatively uh, by this update. And so I've shared with you how some uh, were affected on December 3rd and had pretty much the same um uh, trajectory once they were affected and then others saw it's usually like if you went up December 3rd you went up a little bit further uh, December 10th um, or vice versa if you were down December 3rd you went down a little bit th- further so there's some examples of that in newsletter um, what else can we say about this here? You, you know, people always ask me, and I saw it just as I was about to record this, Moz, uh, Dr. Pete from Moz published um, their post on winners and losers uh, of this update. And I've talked in newsletter, Lily Ray did an excellent article using data from Systrix talking about who are the winners and losers of this update. And, you know, whenever we do this, a lot of people go, well, this is, what's the point because Google algorithm updates affect all sites equally. You know, it's it's rare. Uh, is it rare? I used to. I, I want to say it's rare for Google to just push out an update to affect a certain niche or a certain topic. But we have seen it in the past. So, for example, when. The June 2019 core update happened. Um, We noticed that a lot of the sites that were affected were alternative medical sites. 
And we, we realized that just prior to this update, Google had made changes in the quality raters guidelines where they talked about, and I'll read this here. Uh, here's the quote from the QRG that was added. High EAT information pages on scientific topics should be produced by people or organizations with appropriate scientific expertise and represent well-established scientific consensus on issues where such consensus exists. And so we looked at, all right, well, a whole bunch of alternative medical sites were affected and Google just added this verbiage to the QRG to say, you know, we want to pay attention where websites are not in line with generally recognized, uh, well-established scientific medical consensus. And we did see with that update, that medical sites, and in particular, alternative medical sites were hit strongly with that update. Now, with this update, yes, we do see some changes in alt med sites, but it is not limited to medicine. Um, we saw that a large number of financial websites were affected. Uh, pretty much every YMYL vertical was affected in a strong way. And what's very interesting is when we look at, so you know how I said uh, previous Panda and Penguin were, you know, usually site-wide or big chunks of your site were affected, and then other updates affected uh, things on the page level. I actually think that this update is affecting uh, websites on the keyword level. And this makes sense as Google has um, made some advances in the last year on, and not necessarily Google, there have been advances in the last year or two on understanding language. So uh, I'm going to have a lot more. I'm going to be talking about this a lot for the weeks to come. Uh, and I really, really struggled with how much to put in podcast because uh, there's a lot of things that I think <laughs> this update is about, um, but I don't want to get false information out there. So bear with me. I know a lot of you are waiting uh, on our analysis and it's coming. We've been working on it pretty much every single day. Um, so what else can we say about this? I, you know, I think, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, I do talk in newsletter a bit about specific sites. And when we get into the section uh, where we're going to talk about hrefs in a minute, um, I'll share with with you some specific keywords that are confusing and why this update is really confusing. Uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, I think it really comes down to Google understanding content and we're finding that things that we might not be able to tangibly recognize as signals um, are being noticed by Google. And I know that sounds so vague, uh, but in every case, we'll look at, almost every case, what we're doing is we're looking at clients and we're saying, oh, these particular keywords um, dropped for this page, but these keywords actually increased for this page. And then we'll look at who's ranking for the keywords that dropped. And we'll say, oh, now why did Google elevate this one particular site above our client? And when we look at it in the context of the keyword that was searched, it actually is the site that we would, we would choose if we were the searcher who did that uh, query. So, um, you know, I think Google's got it. Uh, and I think a lot of people aren't going to be happy with this because it's very hard to measure, uh, you know, exactly what Google's doing. And it's going to be hard to recommend recovery. Um, we already have a little bit of recovery advice, but again, I'm going to be waiting for future weeks to uh, uh, solidify some of our thoughts before we get those out. So let's actually talk a little bit about Ahrefs here and how I'm going to share with you how I've been using Ahrefs refs this week to look specifically at keyword data. Uh, most of you who have been listening to this podcast know that Ahrefs came on as a sponsor, a regular sponsor for search news you can use uh, quite a few weeks ago. And we've been trying to formulate the sponsored content in a way that is helpful to everybody. So um, if you're considering signing up for Ahrefs as a, a tool, I would highly recommend it. I've been a client of Ahrefs for many, many years now and, uh, and highly recommend it. Um, but even if you're not considering signing up for the tool, uh, there's still some very good information in here. So one of the things that we've been using a lot this week is Ahrefs Organic Keywords Tool. And uh, this is really, really helpful. You can actually put in a URL on your site. So let's say you have a particular page uh, that is not doing well after this core update. And you can put this URL into Ahrefs and it'll tell you which keywords 
uh, changed in rankings. And you can select, uh, so basically what you do is select the current date and it'll compare it to a previous month. So we compared uh, December rankings, mid-December rankings to mid-November rankings. And of course, there's going to be variability. Every, you know, no rankings are static and stay there forever. But what we're looking for is patterns. Uh, and one of the things that uh, you'll see this in, in newsletter is we looked at a, a site that somebody tweeted about saying that they had lost quite a bit of visibility. And one of the interesting things was uh, you can see that some keywords actually improved dramatically in rankings, and then some important keywords dropped just a few places. And uh, this particular website, you'll see that overall, it was the important keywords that dropped, which caused them to have this big, uh, this big reduction in, in rankings. Um, and then what, and this is very hard to explain over a podcast, over a, a, a vocal, um, an audio recording. Uh, so you might need to see the screenshots and newsletter. I really like how Ahrefs has a chart that shows you the SERP uh, position history. Um, and you can see over the last six months, uh, one month, six months, or I think it's, it goes up to 24 months, um, how sites have changed. So we can see these lines that say, oh, our client, you know, they used to rank number 10. And, and then with this update, they went up to number Number three, and with this update, they're up to number one. You know, those are the good scenarios when that happens. Um, so that's really, really helpful. Uh, this information from Ahrefs, and although you can find uh, keyword ranking data from Google Search Console, I found that it's way faster to just put the URL into Ahrefs, uh, and they seem to be fairly accurate as well. So I would encourage you to uh, to check that out. Um, just a little bit of news. Google spoke a little bit about the future of the structured data testing tool. This is interesting because, uh, you know, when Google removed uh, the rich results test, there was a big uh, to do. And, you know, a lot of people really upset in the SEO community. So I'm going to read this from Google. They, they said, in July, we announced the rich results test is out of beta. In that blog post, we said that the structured data testing tool would be deprecated. Since then, we've heard your feedback, and we'd like to give an update on what the future looks like for the structured data testing tool. To better support open standards and development experience, we're refocusing the structured data testing tool and migrating it to a new domain serving the schema.org community by April of 2021. The main purpose of the tool will be to check syntax and compliance of markup with schema.org standards. Going forward, however, the tool will no longer check for Google search rich results types. So, and it goes on to explain the, the difference. See, there's a lot of schema that is used by Google, and then there's other schema that Google might read, but they don't, it doesn't necessarily translate into rich results. So rich results, a perfect example of that would be review stars. Uh, if you implement review schema, your hope is that when people see your website in the search results, that there will be review stars uh, next to those search results. Uh, you don't always get them, but that's the hope. But there's other types of schema, you know, that you can implement um, that maybe doesn't display a rich result. And so what Google's saying is you can still use the structured data test testing tool for that schema, um, even uh, though it's not producing a rich result. And I think a lot of people are going to be really happy with this. Um, we pulled an interesting tip out of a recent Google Help Hangout. I have to tell you, I'm not up to date on the Help Hangouts uh, with all the stuff that's happened with this Google update. And uh, we've been doing a lot of business stuff at MHC to close up our uh, year end. Uh, I haven't been able to get through the most recent podcasts. So um, this was a good find by my team that um, about discovered currently not indexed. And does that speak? Somebody asked John Mueller whether that speaks to technical or quality quality issues. So if you go to Google Search Console and you look at the coverage section of the report, um, we often look at this to find uh, hints to where the thin content is on a, on a website. And so let's say you have pages in there from a particular section of your site that are all appearing in uh, discovered, currently not indexed. What a lot of people wanted to know is, does that mean uh, that maybe there's a technical issue with the page? Is there, you know, is Google confused by a canonical tag or something like that? And um, John Mueller sort of implied that uh, this is not about technical issues, but rather Google needs to be convinced that indexing those pages will make them valuable 
to somebody who's searching for them. And what we're seeing a lot of now is websites that are, are, are crying out saying something's wrong with Google indexing when what happens, what's actually happening is they're trying to get indexed posts that Google's already got thousands of great posts on this subject and yours is no better than those that are out there. So if you have a lot of pages in this uh, discovered but currently not indexed section, you should be paying attention to those and you should be looking at why would Google say that this is not valuable. In a lot of cases, these pages are essentially doorway pages, um, pages where like it's a template where very little changes from one page to the next. Uh, but we've seen all kinds of pages uh, like this. And so we've got a little bit more in newsletter on that as well. Uh, WordPress users, there are some issues with the most recent WordPress 5.6 release. And apparently most of the issues are surrounding the Gravity Forms use and also the Classic Editor. So if you have a WordPress site and you've updated to 5.6, uh, just know that a lot of people are having issues. And there's a Reddit thread, which we've linked to in newsletter, that will give you some tips on um, fixing these problems if, uh, if this is the issue for you. Going to do a quick sponsored message here from Sitebulb. I'm laughing because um, I saw, I'm sure you guys saw uh, this week, uh, and I, you know, I'm probably breaking some horrible rule of uh, advertising. I hope Sitebulb understands this, but I'm going to talk about a, a competitor. <laughs> um, Semrush uh, had this big thing about how do you pronounce our name? And we've been through this so many times. I recorded a bit of a video for them that I waffled. I was like, I used to say Semrush, and then I got convinced to say SEMrush, and then, uh, because Greg Gifford basically said, look, we don't call it SEO, we call it SEO. Uh, and so I said SEM Rush for a while. Now SEMrush has actually rebranded so that the official uh, way to pronounce it is SEMrush. Um, and so after hearing this, I saw this tweet from Sitebulb saying, We've heard there's a lot of confusion about how to pronounce our name. Uh, which way do you pronounce it? And I can't remember the options they had, but they were like really bizarre. Site bulb -a or something like that. So I'm pretty sure I'm saying it right. Site bulb. But if I'm not, I'm sure that I'll hear something, right? <laughs> so listen, Sitebulb isn't just a web crawler. It's a website auditing tool that carries out comprehensive SEO analysis, giving you the tools to understand the most significant issues and communicate prioritized recommendations to your clients. You get all this with no credits to worry about, no limits on crawls or websites or projects. You can audit any website you want, wherever you want, however you want. So if if you'd like to give Sitebulb a try for free, they've actually given us a code for search news you can use, listeners. Um, you can go to sitebulb.com slash search news and you'll get, uh, I believe it's a 60-day free trial of Sitebulb. So most of the things that people do when you first start using Sitebulb is crawl your site and just enjoy the crawl map. Crawl maps are so much fun. They're, they're addictive. You can just keep crawling sites and look at beautiful patterns. And uh, we've used them a lot to help websites restructure into like a hub and spoke model. Um, so we would highly recommend that you do that. But there's so much more to Sitebulb uh, than just the, um, just the crawl maps. They're, they give incredible hints. Uh, and so if you're trying to improve your website or doing client work, it's something that I think you'll really like. And uh, thank you to Sitebulb for offering that free trial to our users. Uh, our listeners. Uh, we don't have a whole lot to uh, report on in terms of local SEO this week. There really wasn't any obvious ranking fluctuation as we can see on Bright Local's uh, Flux tool. Um, we've got some good articles in newsletter on local SEO, uh, stuff about using Google Trends to like write for local audiences um, and some other things, but, uh, uh, but nothing I want to um, really cover in great detail in podcast this week. I did want to talk though about this article that was on Moz this week from Eric Enge. Um, and this study uh, was basically looking at links. And, you know, Eric used to do this uh, for many years back um, with uh, Stone Temple. And now um, Proficient is running this uh, study where they look at are links still important when it comes to ranking. I think it's no secret that links matter, right? I mean, we're still, I'm sure you get the emails that I get. Uh, I get all the emails that 
people say, hey, I see you're a big fan of guest posts. Would you take a guest post uh, from me? And, you know, they quote my article on how guest posting can get you into trouble if you do too much of it. Um, I mean, people are still actively trying to build links all over the place. And there's a reason for that, because links are very important in Google's algorithms. Now, um, one of the things, so the thing that this study noted was that uh, links are important, but for the most part, it's just links from authoritative websites that are important. And when I read that, it made sense to me because this seems to me to be in line with the changes Google made last year in regards to no follow. I'm laughing because right in front of me, I have a calendar. We have this massive calendar in our office that has not changed since March when we all, uh, when the rest of my staff started working from home. And uh, the, the very first thing in the calendar is no follow changes go live at the beginning of March 2020. If you remember, Google made these changes where they said, look, now no follow is just a suggestion. And we might decide that we want to actually follow some of these links that are no followed. And when I read that, what it meant to me was that um, Google could now start counting links from authoritative websites that perhaps have a no follow tag on them. So take, for example, like if the New York Times wrote an article about SEO, about maybe the most recent Google update, and let's say they quoted me and they linked to my website, but they linked with a no followed link. That's the type of link that Google really wants to count because that's an authoritative publication that's trustworthy. People trust it and uh, it's, it's recommending, uh, it would be recommending me as an expert in terms of SEO or our articles that we've written. Um, and so I think Google was recognizing that, man, most of these big publications, they link out to everybody now with no followed links. So this sort of made it so that only looking at followed links were, um, you know, it, it was leaving big gaps in Google's uh, understanding of which links really should count. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if a massive number of the links on the web are ignored. I, I really think Google's algorithms, they're getting very good at figuring out which links are recommendations that they should be counting and which ones are just there for SEO efforts. So uh, I'll leave you to read the rest of Eric's article. It's a, it's a very, very good article. Um, and I think the take home message from this is not to go out and start buying links, um, but to find ways to actually get mentioned in authoritative places. And that's tricky. Uh, PR can often be very, very helpful. If you're looking for help with uh, actually getting good links, we've connected with a couple of companies that we trust over the years uh, to build up PR um, for you. And there are ways you can do this that are legit. And you know, Google's Guide to SEO says that you should be promoting your website. You should be telling others about your website and asking others to link to you. There's nothing wrong with, um, with doing links building provided you're not just doing it for the sake of SEO. We've talked about that so many times. Um, we've got some other really good recommend reading, recommended reading in the newsletter as well. Uh, in our job section, we have one job that's very, very exciting because MHC is hiring again. Um, I'm thrilled that we're able to hire again. You know, yesterday, was a very long day because we went through staff reviews. Uh, so we have 10 of us here at MHC, and I don't know if it was a brilliant idea or a very dumb idea, but we decided to do all of the staff reviews in one day. <laughs> At the same time as me trying to figure out this Google update. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tired. I've had a very, very busy week. But our staff reviews were so cool. We did this thing where we basically uh, shared about, I shared my thoughts on what I really love about each of my staff. And then we shared, um, we talked about where they want to improve and where they want to learn more and where they want to expand our business. Um, and uh, each of my staff, uh, was I was very excited having these conversations with them. So if you are interested in joining my team, then we're hiring. It is an in-person position. Initially, it'll be remote, uh, you know, because right now it's not safe for people to work together. But as soon as we get the go-ahead and feel safe to come into the office, uh, you'd need to come into the office. We're in Canada, just outside of Ottawa. Actually, Canada is technically a part of Ottawa. Uh, but if you're in the Ottawa area in Canada, you can find out more information at mariehaines.com jobs.
I wanted to end this podcast episode with one question. Now, several people submitted a question this week that I will not be able to answer. And my apologies if you uh, submitted it. Uh, There's only so many hours in the day. And so I chose this one that I think is more relevant to my area of expertise. Um, Somebody asked a question regarding EAT. They say, if we get an expert's quote for an article, then is it okay to add the expert as a secondary contributor of the article through schema? This is a really interesting question because, and and the person who asked it said they've asked around a lot and nobody's really given a reliable answer. So um, schema, there is a schema. So I guess what they're trying to talk about here is, let's say you wrote a medical article and you had a quote from an expert, somebody who actually is an expert. How do you demonstrate that via schema? So there's actually schema for contributor. And uh, I believe Healthline uses this. If you're not sure about schema, often looking at some of the sites that are really killing it in terms of uh, in terms of Google updates can be very helpful. And, and not you don't want to copy things blankly, blindly what uh, other big sites are doing. Um, but often you can get some good ideas. And I do believe Healthline will occasionally use contributor, um, but uh, but that's a, a possibility because if you're adding an expert quote, they're not technically an author. Now you can have multiple authors, and I suppose if the quote was long enough, you could uh, you could probably include them as an author alongside of your um, your medical author that you have uh, for that post. Um, but what we don't know is if Google actually looks at this contributor schema. Now, an interesting thing, I just noticed this morning as I was going through Twitter, John Mueller had a post where somebody was asking about schema and John said, now this sounds like kind of a no brainer. I think everybody understands this, but it's important to mention that when Google sees schema on a page, it's not like they just blindly trust the schema and say, oh, this, you know, website says this article was written by so-and-so, um, when really it wasn't. They they do other things, and I, I feel like the schema sort of backs up uh, the dots that Google is trying to connect. Um, and so if they've already got other evidence to support uh, that um, this is true, then schema potentially could help Google to connect the dots even more. Another type of schema that you could consider using, although it's controversial, is same as schema. Uh, you can say, you know, the, but this really replies, uh, applies to authors. So you can say, well, the author of this post is the same author who writes for search engine land or for, you know, some big uh, authoritative publication. But again, if you're just having a quote from an expert, I feel like contributor schema is the best thing to use here. Um, there's really no harm in doing it. Um, other than the time it takes. But, uh, and I think there's a, it's kind of like everything we do in SEO. You know, we try to follow all the best practices and we may not have 100% evidence that it's going to help, but as long as there's no harm in doing it, then you might as well give it a go. Uh, So that's actually, I want to thank you for asking that question. I think that's something that we'll recommend um, to some of our clients that we're working with on improving the EAT for their content. Uh, I think you need to do everything you can to, uh, to show Google that you have the appropriate expertise uh, to write this article that you're writing. And having a quote from an expert is an excellent thing to do. Uh, I think we're going to end it there. If you are trying to reach us at MHC, our office is going to be closed on December 24th, and we're coming back on January 4th. Everybody's taking a little bit of a break over Christmas. Um, yeah, we're doing our, our staff secret Santa over Zoom. What a weird year, right, to, to do this. Um, but uh, I'm excited, though, that uh, the year's coming to an end, and I think it's been, we, we've done well as a business, it, it, despite the struggles, uh, and so I know a lot of you are still really struggling. Um, I'm going to, at the risk of sounding a little bit, I don't know, is this political or just being polite or uh, smart? I just want to urge all of you who are trying to decide whether to visit family for Christmas, if you're on the fence, stay home. Um, you know, it, it, uh, I don't, I'm not going to preach, but this virus is so scary and so many people are dying. Um, and you might be fine if you go visit your family, but you might not. And so the, the selfless thing to do is to just uh, put up with a little bit more inconvenience for a while. Um, we will get through this and it'll, it'll get better eventually. So we're going to continue to dig into the December core update. I'll probably be doing a little bit of that over Christmas too. Um, I'm going to be back next week though, talking about uh, my further thoughts and we'll see what else I can give to you in next week's episode as well. Hope you're doing well and I wish you the best of luck with your rankings. 